So now that we have some basic definitions down, I want to talk about how we can actually calculate probabilities, how we can get numbers, right, numeric values. And there are several different types of probabilities. There's really two that we're going to be interested in, right? So we're going to so the first kind of probability we're going to talk about is called an experimental probability. And as the name suggests, we're going to calculate these probabilities based on actual data. Somebody has gone out into the world, they've observed things, they've asked people questions, they've come back with the results of their research. Those are what we're going to use to do our calculations. So you notice I've got a, a kind of a new notation over here on the left-hand side, this P of A. All right. What this means is, this is the probability that event A occurs. Right, and I really want you to focus on that A part, because that is, that is the driving point of a probability calculation. We are always going to be thinking about probabilities in terms of a specific event. Right, so how are we going to do this? Well, look at my, my formula here. I'm going to take the number of times event A occurred in my data results, and I'm going to divide that by the total number of outcomes, the total number of people we talked to, the total number of fish we pulled out of the lake and weighed. Right, This is the size of our sample. Okay, so now before we jump in and do that, uh, there, there's a couple of really important uh, properties I want to talk about here. Um, first, there are, are limits on probabilities. All right, probabilities have to be between zero and one. Right, and and to see why, let's think about our formula: the probability of A equals number of times A occurred divided by total number of outcomes. Okay, so first, the total number of times that A occurred has to be less than or equal to the total number of outcomes. Right? You, you go out and you ask, you ask people a yes or no question, for example. The number of people who said yes has to be strict, has to be less than or equal to the total number of people you talk to. Right, so that means that the numerator here is always less than the denominator. Well, if the numerator is less than the denominator in a fraction, that fraction is less than or equal to 1. So that's this first part here. And to see that it, it has to be greater than or equal to 0, well, there's no way event A can occur a negative number of times. Right, so there's no way a probability can ever be a negative number. Okay, and we've got two more here. And if an event can't occur, it's impossible, right? Well, think about what that means in terms of the number of times we're going to see this event occurring in our data. If the event can't happen, then the number of times it happens has to be zero. That means the, numer of, the numerator of our fraction is zero divided by some number i really don't care what at this point because zero divided by a number number greater than zero is going to be equal to zero but now look at the the other way around if an event always occurs every time you do this experiment you are going to get event a that means the number of times a happens has to equal the total. In other words, the numerator and denominator of our fraction are the same. If the numerator and denominator of a fraction are the same and not equal to zero, then the fraction reduces to one. All right, three important rules here, and I, and I really want you to file this first one away. All right, that first one's gonna come back, we're really gonna get some mileage out of it as we go along. Okay, so let's look at some, let's look at some data. Right, a pollster stands outside the Magic Castle at Disney World and asks people how many people they came with. What, what's the size of their party? Right, and he gets the following results. Th uh, there were 15 people who were there by themselves, 37 who were just there with someone else, 
Uh, 52 and 78, you're getting up into families, groups of three and four. So I want to know what is the probability of two. In other words, if I go out and I randomly pick a person from the park, what is the probability that that person came in a party of two? And remember our formula. This is the number of parties of two divided by the total number of parties in the data. Well, how many parties of two were there? That's right here. There were 37. And how many were there all together? Well, look, just add up your numbers, right? That's 10, 17, 22, uh, 6, 11, 18, 37 out of 182. Okay, now, most of the time, I would say that's a perfectly good answer. There's nothing wrong with a fraction for an answer and leave it alone. Okay, but statistics is, is kind of one of those exceptions in the math world. It is fundamentally a practical subject, right? And, and I always tell my, tell my students there, there are two exceptions to when you should leave your answer as a fraction, right? One of them is you're graphing something because graphing 32 fifths, I don't know where that is. You make it into a fraction, into a decimal, and it's easier. And the second is when you're doing a practical problem, right? So I would take this. I would go to my calculator, 37 divided by 182. That is 0 0.280. Now, at this point, the question always comes up, how many decimal points should I go to? Well, this physics guy, the science guys, they've got all sorts of rules about significant digits and this and that. I usually just go out to three decimal places, right? Three decimal places is usually going to, for, for our purposes, for you know, for mathematical purposes, that's usually going to give us a sufficient level of accuracy. All right, let's try another one here, right? Pollster stands, same data, right? Guy standing outside the Magic Castle. Um, what's the probability of getting a group with more than two people? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's write it out. Let's get, get some practice with our notation. Probability X is greater than 2. And again, I, I, I keep adding notation here, right? In statistics, when we talk about X, this generic variable X, this refers to an individual data value. So what I'm saying here is what is the probability that a randomly selected individual is a member of a group with more than two people. Well, let's apply our formula again. This is the number of groups with more than two people divided by the total number of groups. Well, the denominator hasn't changed, although I forgot what it was. The denominator is, sorry, 10, 17, 22, 6, 11, 18, 182. And the numerator, how many groups with more than two people were there? Well, now I'm talking about two groups, right? Three and four. Those both fit that description. So my numerator here will be the sum of these two, 52 plus 78 is 130. And again, you can go to your calculator now, 130 divided by 182 is 0 0.714. Okay, if this seems familiar, right? Hopefully hopefully this does seem a, seem a little familiar, right? What am I doing here? I'm taking a part of the group and dividing it by the entire group. I'm taking a, the size of a part and dividing it by the size of the whole. Okay, well, if you think back, that's how we calculate percentages, right? The size of a section of a, of a pie chart divided by the total, right? That's how we calculate a percentage. And that's exactly what these probabilities are, right? Saying that 71 0.4% of the population was 
in a group greater than two people is the same as saying the probability x is greater than 2 is 0.714. Right? These probabilities and percentages really are interchangeable with each other. Okay, so what's next? There, there is another kind of probability. Right? This, this was a, an experimental probability. There's another kind called the theoretical probability, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next lecture.